Okay, so uh, hello everyone. Uh, can you hear me back there? Yeah. Okay, so uh, thank you for having me here and I want to thank uh, PJ and Johnny who just left for uh, inviting me here and making this great conference. Uh, I really enjoyed yesterday's talks and I had a lot of fun meeting many of you. So looking forward to today. So uh, I got a warning up front. I have this tendency to speak pretty fast. Sorry about that, but I want to give you as much as possible, try to pack as much as possible in my talk. So hope it's going to be worth your time. And also, during this talk, you may get this impression that I'm trying to sell you something, and I just want to state up front that uh, this is not what I'm trying to do. Uh, the position I'm taking in this talk and all my talks is that of a happy user, a satisfied customer. And this is really how I think of myself when I uh, consider Elixir and Erlang. I've been using both languages for uh, many years now, and I'm really, really happy with them, and the OTP framework and the associated ecosystem, third-party libraries, uh, frameworks, and a lot of great tools that we have. And I really feel those things help me do my job. Uh, help me focus uh, on the core problems of my job. But still, there is absolutely no doubt in my mind that uh, like the most important piece of the puzzle uh, here is the runtime layer itself, the virtual machine, the official one, which we call Beam. And this is the thing that I believe takes this whole system and puts it very far apart, very, be very, very different and special compared to anything else that we have available today. And it is a thing that I feel helps me the most with some of the most difficult challenges I'm about to face, regardless of the precise nature of the project I'm going to work on. And I just want to state that uh, Beam, as the runtime layer, is actually not great for every type of software, which is in fact precisely what makes it great in my personal opinion, because rather than trying to be a jack of all trades and therefore a master of none, Beam is built with a strong focus on a particular class of problems, a particular class of software, and I like to call such software a software system. And this is the kind of software that you build, you put it into production, you start it once, and henceforth it has to run continuously, constantly, for like a long time, many years, maybe decades even. And it has to do many different things at any point in time to serve the needs of many, many users, uh, depending on the system, like 24-7 uh, every day of the year. And of course it goes without saying, it should do those things within some reasonable time constraints, whatever that means for each particular use case. Now, Think uh, web servers, backends of any kind, uh, crawlers, chatbots. We seem to have a lot of interesting emerging examples in the embedded area as well. So quite a lot of different software falls into this category that I'm labeling a software system. And that there's a lot of software which is not a software system. And if you're building those other kinds of things, like especially some more complex things on a larger scale, uh, it's very likely that Beam is not the hammer to that particular nail. But if you are building a software system, regardless some kind of a web-facing system, uh, regardless of a business domain complexity or scale, there is no doubt in my mind that uh, Beam-facing languages are your best option available today, precisely because the runtime layer itself is fine-tuned for the problem. Right? It has some properties, it makes some strong guarantees, and some trade-offs are made in implementation, which are very well suited for the class of software systems. And this is what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to cherry-pick only a few examples and try to explain why do I feel are they relevant in uh, this particular kind of software. So it's going to be technical, but nothing super deep. You, you don't need to worry about that. Uh, it's more like a high-level look at our lowest layer that we're using. And uh, for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to assume that the thing called NIF does not exist. Now NIF, uh, for those of you who are not familiar, stands for Native Implemented Functions. It is a mechanism that allows you to write your own custom native code, like in C, C++. Recently, people have been doing it with, with Rust. Um, and to run that thing directly in the Beam operating system process. And when you do that, then all the guarantees are off, right? Like you can crash your entire system, you can uh, completely paralyze it, leak memory resources and whatnot. So it comes with a lot of power and a lot of bad stuff can happen. Um, and this is why I usually say it should be like your last resort. Uh, it's perfectly valid if you want to wanna implement some parts of your system in uh, some other third party languages, uh, which do not compile down to Beam. Uh, but there are some other safer options, which are not as performant, but way safer, and this is what I would recommend first. So whenever I say something is guaranteed or something cannot happen, this really isn't true if you take NIFs into the equation, uh, but I'm going to remove them from this discussion. Okay, so let's get down to business. Um, right, so you have your system powered by Beam. Like, let's say it's written in Elixir, it's as a mixed project, you start it, whether it's locally uh, with a mixed tool or in uh, production, which in my opinion should always be an OTP release, um, the story is go always going to be the same. So you get your own operating system process, uh, your own instance of Beam, and in there you're going to have a couple of threads running uh, called schedulers, by default one per CPU core, but completely configurable. There will be some other threads which I'm going to ignore today. 
And then you have a bunch of these, what I like to call little yellow boxes, these lightweight beam processes. And you're gonna have way more of them. Like this is idiomatic Erlang and Elixir. Uh, I usually like to describe it as run different things separately. You wanna uh, run different activities in separate processes. And this quickly leads to explosion of these processes like in smaller systems, you might have hundreds of them, larger systems, tens, hundreds of thousands, millions of those things could be running around during some peak periods. So this is what's gonna give you a lot of superpowers. And the first thing I'm gonna talk about is context switching uh, in the schedulers, right? So schedulers are the ones which are actually running those things. Like a scheduler pulls a process, the process hits the scheduler, and now it has some CPU time. It can run some beam instructions. And during that time, if it doesn't need CPU anymore, like it's sleeping, or maybe it's waiting for a message to arrive, or maybe it's uh, waiting for an IO operation to finish, then it's gonna implicitly yield and someone else gets the slot. But if it's highly CPU bound, like for a long time, say computing pi to billions of decimals, then it's gonna be switched out and this is gonna happen, usually it's gonna happen pretty quickly, like in less than one millisecond. And I say usually because the actual implementation is not based on fixed time slices. So under some condition, arguably, arguably not very likely, it can happen that a single process holds on to a scheduler for much longer, like maybe a couple of tens of milliseconds. Uh, but I'm not personally aware of any kind of Elixir code which we can write that could hold on to a scheduler forever, which is why I like to say that for all practical intensive purposes, the scheduler is preemptive. Uh, and what this means, right, so we have like preemption and uh, very frequent preemption, very frequent context switching. What this means for our system, it brings us a property which I like to call responsiveness. And instead of trying to describe it, I'm gonna try to demo it with a simple, through a simple site that I built here for you. Uh, it's powered by, uh, by Cowboy and Plug. I'm gonna start the thing uh, and to make things a little bit more explicit and uh, clear, I'm gonna explicitly state that I want to have just one scheduler thread. And let's start the thing. Okay, and let me start the observer thingy. Okay, so we can visualize stuff, right? So you can see here, hopefully, that we have, a one, we have one scheduler thread. It's already a little bit busy because the observer itself is implemented in planar lung, so whatever it does, it also uses this scheduler, right? So every single beam process of this beam instance is gonna use the scheduler thread. So now let me show you the site. Do not be intimidated by the complex uh, user interface. I'm gonna walk you through it step by step. Okay, so what, what does it do? I give it a number, it gives me a sum of first n natural numbers. And if I give it a larger number, I'm gonna get a larger sum, which is hopefully correct. I actually have no tests to back this claim. Um, but it, it doesn't really matter, in fact, because what does matter here is that the implementation is completely CPU bound, right? So there's no yielding, sleeping, message passing, uh, file operations and whatnot. So basically goes from one to n and accumulates the sum along the way. So if I give it a large enough number, then of course it's gonna keep this single thread, uh, scheduler thread busy. And this is what we're gonna try. I'm gonna give it the magical, mystical nine nines. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nines, right? So hopefully that's right. Let me check it out. And when, we, when I go to the scheduler, <coughs> utilization hits, you know, now we're fully maxing out of the scheduler. I gotta move quickly here. So the site is still responding, right? In a separate tab, I can run stuff and I can get my responses pretty quickly. This thing here is still ticking and it's just finished, right? So what you've just seen is the long running computation was running and it wasn't really too much extended, relatively speaking. You know, so the running time is in the ballpark and the short running uh, requests were pretty quickly served. And this is what I like to call responsiveness. Right, so let's talk a little bit more about that. Right, so what you get is, let's say that you have like a web server on this machine with a single core. Uh, you have single scheduler thread and you have five requests pending, like tasks that need to be done, all of them CPU bound. The first one, quite heavy, 10 seconds of CPU time, that's quite intense. The remaining four, fairly short ones, one millisecond each. And what you're gonna get with Beam is like after five milliseconds, you have already served four out of five requests, then you're handling the rest of the long computation. And even while you're doing this, you can still take more work and serve it pretty quickly, assuming it doesn't require a lot of computational time itself. Right, so this is what you want in a system because you're juggling with needs of many different independent people. Now in contrast with cooperative scheduling, and I wanna say that many of popular technologies today are gonna to give you this type of scheduling. Uh, <clears throat> when the task hits the scheduler or this thread, then it doesn't let go for as long as it needs CPU. So for the first 9,999 milliseconds, nobody gets their response, right? Latencies, all the latencies are 10 seconds plus just because you have one super heavy long running computation. So this is not really quite good. And I don't wanna say that cooperative scheduling is universally bad, but I don't think it's a good default or a good choice for a software system. And you can suffer from this problem even if you have 
multiple threads because the story is roughly this. Like you're gonna have to deal with a bunch of, uh, bu bunch of uh, logical activities, right? Like thousands or mi millions maybe. Like handling requests, doing some background processing and whatnot. And you're gonna have a fairly small, usually fixed size pool of operating system threads because those are heavy resources. So you can have like millions of them. So what you need is just to have a couple of these tests, just a small fraction of your system being super CPU busy for a little bit longer and uh, most of your system is on hold. Busyness of one or few leads to paralysis of many or all. And uh, this is definitely not good. I have seen this situation in uh, production myself. I've seen this thing take down the production. Um, so technically speaking, it was working, but uh, basically all, all the threads were busy and nobody was able to get their response within any kind of acceptable time. So for all intents and purposes, it was down. Not only have I seen it, I have actually did it myself. Uh, not intentionally, but by mistake. I make mistakes uh, from time to time, like probably on a daily basis. And this was a great example of how seemingly low level technical property amplified my mistake and led to production being completely down, right? So that's, that's pretty, pretty bad in my opinion. Now Beam is way more forgiving towards such types of mistakes. Like if you have a couple of these things, then your system is ticking as I have shown you. And of course, if you have more of these long running tasks, then they're gonna put a pressure on those schedulers and uh, your latencies are gonna increase, your performance is gonna suffer, but this de degradation is gonna happen gradually, gracefully. So you'll get a time to spot that something is off and to maybe uh, understand what's the problem and fix it be before it completely blows your production up, right? So this leads me to the next point. The next property I wanna discuss, and this is the fact that uh, activities of your system powered by Beam are first class runtime things. Now what I mean by this is, as I've said initially, you wanna run different activities as separate processes, and these processes are implemented at the runtime layer, right? So therefore your activities are runtime entities. I'm, st I'm stressing this because there are some popular lightweight concurrency implementations which do this on the library level, and therefore they are not runtime entities, obviously. Another part of this uh, puzzle is that uh, activities have identities. Uh, right, so these processes have identities, which is again not always the case. The most notable example is Go, uh, uh, based on CSP concurrency model, where activities are anonymous and communication channels have identities. Now in Beam, you have basically activities as runtime entities with identities, and what this means is that uh, uh, you can manage and manipulate these activities by talking to your runtime directly, even if they themselves refuse to cooperate. So this is pretty important, but sounds quite fluffy and vague, so I'm gonna try to demo what I mean by this. So let me head back to this uh, site. I'm gonna show you a bug, you're gonna immediately know what's the problem, uh, but let's pretend that we don't know and let, let's see where it takes us. Right, so like if I enter a negative number here, uh, then this thing is gonna, never gonna return, right? So you can tell here that it's just spinning, and if I go to the scheduler, then it's completely maxing out, but it's never gonna return. Like even if I close this tab, it's still computing there. So it's maxing out my scheduler. And of course, as I've shown you, the site is still responsive, so that's cool. Um, but if we get more of these things running, we're just gonna do a denial of service and essentially the system is not gonna be working. So we need to find what's wrong. And assuming that I have some like proper monitoring and alerting system in place, I should get some notification like my CPU utilization is way off and now as a developer I wanna uh, go to the production and see what's wrong, understand what, what's causing this problem. And this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna debug the thing. Um, of course, I'm doing this thing uh, locally, but whatever I'm showing you holds for production. You can tune into a running production without needing to restart it, set some environment flags, or God forbid, redeploy a tweaked version of your system. You can hook into a running production, and you can get a lot of useful in info just by talking to your runtime about your activities. And this is the point I'm trying to drive. Right, so I'm gonna use like low level stuff. There are some, you actually don't wanna use this in real production. You, you have some higher level uh, tools which are easier to use and a little bit more production safe, but I just wanna drive this point and keep it fairly lightweight. Right, so we wanna find out who's burning our CPU. And this has to be clearly one or more processes. So what I'm gonna do first is I'm gonna list the processes uh, that I have running in the system. So I get a list of PIDs and now I can go through each of them and uh, I can ask my runtime something about them. Right, so in this particular case, what I'm interested in is a property called reduction count. Uh, or reductions, and I'm gonna keep it very simple and stupid. It is a number, the higher the number, the busier the process is. I'm kind of dumbing it down here and skipping some fine points, but that's, that's the idea. So we're, we're, I'm gonna look for the ones which have the highest reduction count. Um, those are the ones which should be the busiest. Um, so what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna pack this thing in a tuple, so I get a list of tuples, reduction count plus a PID, and now it's pretty much straightforward. It's uh, smooth sales. Basically, I need to sort this thing in a descending order, uh, 
and then let's see, okay, and then let me take just the top n of them, like say five, and then I'm gonna, uh, for the better UI, UX, I'm just gonna print each one on a separate line. Okay, so we have top five uh, reduction counts, and you can tell that the winner is way busier than the runner-up, and therefore this process here uh, is the cause of our problems, right? So we were able to find the thing that's causing the problems, now I'm gonna, we're gonna drill into it, and we're gonna find, find out what it does. So let me take this PID into a variable, right? So I'm taking this identity because, you know, this thing, this thing, that thing has the identity. And the first thing I can do is I can take a look at the current stack trace, right? Like a snapshot. And keep in mind that this thing is completely out of control. It doesn't cooperate with me, but I can still find out a lot about it, right? So I get the stack trace and I can tell that it's like cowboy, so it's a web request. It's a router, so I can narrow it down. It's sum, so now I already know what type of the request, the file name, the line number, and I can go back to the code, stare at it, you know, like contemplate, meditate, maybe something comes up and I, I can see some potential problem. But why stop there, you know, I can, I can get much better than this. I can actually ask my runtime to trace me the activity in this process alone. Out of all millions of them running around the production, I can hook into this one little thing and I can see what happens, and this is what we're gonna do. I'm gonna use a DBG module because it's out of the box. It's kind of gnarly, arcane, you know, a little bit cryptic, but uh, it can do a lot of stuff, right? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start a tracer, and now I'm gonna say that I'm interested in tracing just this process. And in particular, I wanna trace only function calls. You can trace a bunch of other stuff like garbage collections, messages being sent and received and whatnot, so but I'm gonna look at just the dynamics of this particular process. And then I'm gonna set the pattern. Uh, I'm interested in local calls of every single module. So every, every function of every single module. This is gonna generate quite a lot of output. It's gonna basically uh, hog this uh, shell session. So what I'm gonna do here is a cheap trick. I'm just gonna sleep for a single second. And then I'll uh, stop the thing. Okay, so hopefully I didn't make a mistake here because it's gonna mess with my dramatic buildup. Let's see. Okay, looks fine. And stop. Yes, okay, so we have one second trace. <laughs> thank you very much, thank you. <laughs> do not do this at home, right? I'm trained professional. So, uh, we have one second trace of the activity of that particular process, and you can tell that it's just infinitely recursing, and now I pretty much know what's the problem. Like, like in 99% of the cases, the root cause of the problem is that I was trying to be too smart about too insignificant thing, right? So in this particular case, I was trying to make sum as a tail recursive uh, implementation, so I'm recursing, passing three arguments, the start, the finish, and the accumulated sum. Every time I recurse, I increment start by one, and I'm gonna stop when start and finish are the same, which is never gonna happen for a negative number, for a floating point number, probably some other edge cases around. Now I can go back to the code, I can fix the thing. I can even hot patch it, you know, in production without needing to restart it. Uh, but in the meantime, you know, this thing here is still, uh, it's still consuming my CPU, right? So we're still maxing out on the scheduler. And uh, we can do a little bit here to help the production. So what I'll do here is I'll stop the thing, right? So um, I'm gonna send it an exit signal, and in particular, I'm gonna send it a kill exit signal, which is special because it cannot be trapped. It cannot be intercepted. This is kind of like kill minus nine, right? So we are brutally killing uh, the activity. And I'm gonna do this thing, and you can see the log entry, and going back to the scheduler, we're now back to the normal utilization. Right, so what you've just witnessed is, I, I approached the system and I was able to quickly sift through like millions of things running around the system to find the rotten piece, then drill into the rotten piece to find why is it rotten and then take it out without disturbing anything else in the process. And I'm not aware of anything else that comes even remotely close to this level of service. Like even this seemingly simple and naive uh, feature of being able to forcefully terminate an activity gone rogue is gonna be mission impossible for the vast majority of popular technologies today. Like the best case that they're gonna give you um, is something along the lines of this. You know, you, uh, you politely ask the thing to stop itself and then you hope and pray that it's gonna stop itself, which is not gonna happen in the case you've seen, right? So uh, what your best and only option in that case is gonna be to, to restart the whole operating system process. And uh, uh, that means that you're gonna have to take down thousands or millions of perfectly well functional, healthy activities uh, down as a collateral. And that's pretty shitty if you ask me. Right, so in Erlang you can get much better, you can get this thing, I can ask the thing to stop itself, but I can talk to my runtime to make some stronger guarantees. I can ask my runtime, let me know if that thing dies, no matter how. Right, so I set up a monitor to a process, and then I ask the process to stop politely, and now it has the chance to flush its work, say some final last words, and then I'm waiting for the corresponding message. And now, no matter how the process dies, you know, even if it crashes before my uh, request uh, reaches it, I'm gonna get this message, I'm gonna know that it has terminated. So that's one big thing uh, 
that I get here. Uh, and of course, me being a separate process, I can wait for this down message to arrive uh, for some time. If it doesn't, then the other thing refuses to stop. Maybe it's busy, maybe just ignoring my request. And I'm gonna brutally kill it, right? So I'm gonna send it a kill exit signal. And then I'm awaiting again for the down message because the exit signal itself is asynchronous. So I need to wait for the down message, but now I'm pretty sure that it's gonna happen because this is brutal termination. And what you've seen here is a, a sketch of how a supervisor terminates its children, right? So polite, please stop, followed by a brutal, brutally die if you refuse. Uh, the only difference is it doesn't use a special message. It uses an exit signal, which is not kill, right? But that's the only difference. So this is kind of the core idea. Another interesting thing we can do uh, because we can uh, forcefully terminate our activities. So this sketch, this snippet that you see is uh, an, a computation with a cut of time, right? With an upper time limit. So uh, this is kind of like here I'm the manager process and I start the computation in a separate process. It is a task. I don't care about the boundness. It can be IO, CPO, doesn't matter. Uh, and so now as a manager, you know, as every self-respecting manager, I basically, what do I do? Nothing. Right, so I stare at the clock and wait for the result to arrive. If the result arrives, I'm gonna take the credit, you know, do something with it and yay. But if the result doesn't arrive within some given time constraints, then I'm gonna terminate the worker. Right, so I'm invoking task shutdown with a reason brutal kill. Under the hood, this is gonna do what you've seen on the previous slide. It's gonna do a process exit kill, followed by, uh, it's gonna then await for the down message. I don't know if James, are you here somewhere? Yeah, he's kind of, oh, there you are, okay. Yeah, I'm not sure why are you using brutal kill there, um, but um, under the hood, it's a special reason kill, process exit with a special reason kill is used. Okay, so a lot of this stuff that I've shown you, again, I just want to drive this point. The first and foremost thing, the property that, that makes it possible is the fact that we can talk to our runtime about activities. So the runtime knows about those activities and they have identities. This is, this is a big deal uh, for me. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is share nothing concurrency. This is pretty famous property. Um, and it's a great example of a trade-off uh, made in the implementation of Beam. So uh, I usually like to describe it as these processes are essentially separate programs. You know, they just happen to be running in the same operating system process but have nothing in common really. They have their own flow of execution, have their own stack, their own heap, uh, share no memory. And uh, because of this property, you have to pay the price when those things communicate. Like when, when you're sending messages across process boundaries, uh, the message is being copied. In most cases, there is one optimization path, but for the most cases, it's being copied. Uh, so therefore, you have to pay the price in some uh, memory, of course, and uh, especially in some time. Uh, the good thing about it, though, is that the, that the cost of this message passing is explicit, it's obvious, it's upfront, and therefore, when you're tuning your system, when you're benching it, when you're optimizing, you're gonna see this cost and you're gonna optimize your messaging protocol. Like, you're gonna reduce the chattiness between processes and you're gonna remove or, or, or avoid sending needless pieces of data across process boundaries. And the cool thing about that is that it makes it easier, not easy, but easier to spread these little yellow boxes around multiple machines because your messaging protocol is already optimized, right? So that's one good thing. Another good thing is that by paying the price up front, you don't have to pay the completely uh, unexpected, surprising, non-predictable, and sometimes very expensive price of stop the world garbage collection. So we don't have the thing in the beam. Um, and what's great about that is that you get more predictability. predictability. Like you're uh, tuning your system, you're benching it, and you reach some target desired performance, and you put it into production, and uh, you can expect more consistency there. You can expect less gotchas and surprises over time. Right? So that's another nice thing. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, another par part of this puzzle that I actually want to talk about here is um, the fact that resources are also owned by processes. So what I mean by this is like stuff like uh, file handles and network sockets, ETS tables, uh, monitors, traces, and whatnot, all of those things belong to some process. Like usually by default one that actually creates them. Like if I open a network socket, then I'm the owner, and I can give it away to you, and then you're the owner. But someone is always the owner, that's the point. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> now what this means is that when a process terminates, no matter how it terminates, uh, everything is properly cleaned up. Like memory is reclaimed, and files are closed, and sockets are closed, and so on and so forth. Uh, and even, that means even if the process is brutally killed, and this is important because brutal termination means you don't get to say final last words. You cannot catch the thing. You cannot do the try after or anything else. So uh, still, the stuff is gonna be properly cleaned up. And I'm just gonna briefly show, showcase this. So I'm gonna head back to the side. And uh, I'm gonna do it from the command line. I need to curl this side. Just a second, let's, okay. So let me try the good case. This is cool. And now I'm gonna do the minus one thing again. So again, I'm running a request that runs for infinity. Now we're gonna kill this, this thing. 
Um, this time I'm gonna do it in the observer to make things a little bit quicker. So this one is uh, the, top, the top one, and this is the process that I'm gonna kill. That's the request handler, and it, it owns the socket, right? It's gonna send the response over that socket. And I'm gonna kill the thing, and immediately here I get an empty reply from server because the process has died and the socket has been closed on the server and therefore uh, the client has now received the proper information. Right? So that's just a demo uh, that even when you have brutal termination, the thing is gonna be killed. Okay, so finally I wanna discuss how OTP supervisor actually sits on top of this seemingly simple low level properties and gives some guarantees of its own. Right, so OTP supervisors are usually discussed in terms of uh, restarting failing activities. And this is arguably the most important point, but it, uh, feature, but it's not the only one. Uh, the thing I'm gonna talk about here is our supervision trees. So a supervision tree is basically the way that allows you to, like you have these thousands and millions of processes in your system, and with the supervision tree you organize them into uh, services of subservices, of microservices, of nanoservices, of pico services, and so on and so forth, you just drill down, right? So that's kind of the idea. What you see here is uh, an example of a supervision tree uh, that I had a couple of months ago when I was demoing Phoenix at a local conference in my city. So we have like a top level supervisor, it's a system, and when I start a system, uh, it consists of a backend service and a front end service. So starting a system means I'm gonna start the backend service fully, then I'm gonna start the front end service fully, and then the system is considered to be started, and so on and so forth, you get the idea. Now, uh, when you have such a system, you know, I just wanted to say, think about it as, it as if it's kind of an init system for your beam. It's like init D, if you will. And uh, now when this thing is running, there will be some various situations when you wanna stop a working service. There, there are a bunch of reasons for that. Like sometimes you wanna do this explicitly because of the flow in your application. Other times you wanna do this, uh, you specify a rest for one or one for all supervision strategy. And this essentially means you're telling to the supervisor if this thing terminates, then terminate all of these other children because they are somehow deeply connected. They are tightly coupled. So sometimes you do that. Uh, there are another, another frequent cases when you have a bunch of restarts in a single supervisor and uh, then the supervisor gives up. It says, I can't fix this problem. I'm gonna terminate my complete subtree and I'm gonna delegate the thing further up the chain. Right, so a bunch of different reasons. These are not the only ones. And uh, basically, like if I wanna stop a front end system, I wanna get that, right? Like you would expect to have the proper subtree cleaned up with everything with all the associated resources. That's what you would expect and that's, this is what the supervisor is gonna give you. No, you can mess it up, but it's an opt-in. You really need to look for trouble to get into trouble, right? So the, by default, uh, it's gonna work pretty, pretty well. And the reason why it can guarantee this is because it sits off top on these uh, simple guarantees. So frequent contact switching with preemption means that no matter what the workers do, even the, if they're super busy uh, hogging up your CPU and scheduler, the supervisor is gonna get its CPU time to do its work, right? So that's one important property. And because we have uh, first class runtime activities. That means that the supervisor can work with its runtime to manage those activities. It can ask to be notified when things terminate and it can also ask to forcefully terminate those things if they refuse to stop themselves. And finally, of course, share nothing concurrency, especially uh, resource ownership means that uh, you're gonna get a proper cleanup, files and handles and network sockets are gonna be closed and whatnot. Now, these are the foundation of a supervisor and take any of these properties away, you know, pick any one, take them away and things might look the same at the surface level. Uh, they might even work well for a lot of cases but uh, there will be some non-obvious, very treacherous, uh, uh, ugly, nasty problems lurking. You might end up with dangling processes which could lead to re and race conditions and you could have leaking memory and resources and you can have excessive uh, needless CPU consumption which could lead to uh, self-denial of service. You could uh, like uh, completely block your uh, scheduler. Right, so a bunch of nasty problems. Basically, uh, the system is not able to self-heal properly in all situations anymore and sometimes the attempt to self-heal is actually gonna aggravate your problem uh, so that's you know, pretty, pretty terrible. The fault tolerance layer itself becomes faulty. And that's pretty bad in my opinion because fault uh, tolerance is, I believe, one of the most important property of any kind of a software system that is supposed to run for a long time. So if you are aware of these risks, you can of course mitigate them. You can work hard, you can uh, follow some best practices and do thorough code reviews and whatnot, and you can improve your chances, but no matter how hard you work, how much you try, you're never gonna be able to fully eliminate uh, the risk because the risk itself originates from your runtime. And this leads me to uh, the main point of this talk, like this super big and important message I wanna send to the world. Uh, so I have this feeling, this strong feeling that uh, as the community of software developers, many of us, not, not, I'm not talking here, but you know, like in general, uh, when we're choosing our tool for the job and comparing different tools and discussing them, 
it seems to me that we put a huge amount of emphasis on these things on the right side. Uh, sometimes I almost kind of get this impression that the success of a software system and its reliability uh, depends on whether you have curly braces and semicolons and out-of-the-box one-line deployment commands. You know? And I'm not going to say that these things on the right side are not important. They're, of course, important. You want to have some, uh, some reasonable syntax and you want to have some flat learning curve and approachable uh, community and you want to have, of course, West ecosystem of libraries, frameworks, tools, and so on. But uh, the thing is that if, if you have those things sitting on top of an inappropriate runtime, which doesn't give you some uh, foundational guarantees, then those things are an empty shell, right? They're like a shiny facade on top of a shaky structure. And in contrast, if you have like a properly designed runtime with respect to the kind of problem you're solving, uh, then it's straightforward to uh, support different syntaxes and to uh, to flatten the learning curve and to evolve the ecosystem. Uh, and of course, a great example of this is Elixir itself. You, because you see, the runtime is basically your foundation. It is your ground, right? And when the ground is solid, then you can move with a lot of confidence at a predictable pace, never looking back, never regretting your past choices. You can build your system and watch them grow and evolve beyond your original plans and imagination. And basically, uh, this is why I believe that when considering your tool for the job, especially for a software system, uh, I would say that you should ask not only what your language and your library and your uh, framework can do for you, but you should first and foremost ask uh, what your runtime can do for you because it can make a really huge difference. Thank you.